minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. Should we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, it is definitely indeed a pleasure to be in your house and to worship you again today. We know that you are in this place and that you will always be wherever we gather to worship you. And we thank you for that. We know that you are a mighty and merciful God. And it's your mercy and grace that leads us through every day and brings us back to you. And we thank you for your undying mercy and grace that you show towards us. We ask that you will be with us in this next hour as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Um, do you have a special hiding place? Who wants to volunteer? Right here. Where do, where's your hiding place? Under my bed. Under the bed. <laughs> my toys were under the bed. I couldn't fit. Okay, anybody else? Hiding place. I know we do. Think about it. You know, Adam and Eve in the garden had a hiding place. We'll get that to that. Think about it. Um, we used to play hide and seek a lot at our house. I would fit in the flower bin. Good place. <laughs> Nobody ever found me. And um, at school, we played hide and go seek. And at Easter, I stopped, took a picture of the tree. It hasn't grown a whole lot, even though it's been quite a while. But the ditch under the tree was a really good place to hide. And, uh, okay. So, in on our farm where the tractor went to the field and we took the dairy cows down that path, there were a lot of trees. There were some silver maples. My sister was here this week and she reminded me how much fun it was to play inside the trees. Now, this tree doesn't have a big hole, but they were big silver maples and there was about eight of them and we could hide. Not all of them had a hole, but there were a couple that were really special. So trees are a good hiding place. Um, Adam and Eve played hide and seek with God after they disobeyed God about with the tree, eating the fruit, and they were afraid. And when God came, and it spoke in Genesis 3, verse 8, the first book of the Bible, it says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among one of the trees. Evil made them afraid. And God knew where they were. He called to them. But... They still, you know, they needed, they thought they needed shelter, but you can't hide from God. And as I was growing up, remember this song, and Donna and I sort of practiced this, and maybe you know this song. And we're just going to sing the uh, chorus, and I want to teach it to you. You cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. That's twice, so say that. Okay. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you cannot hide from God. His eyes are fixed on you. You cannot hide from God. It's a special message. Okay, Donna, we need a note or two here. You can from God. You cannot hide from God. Lots of help now. Everybody out there, I know you know this song. You, how many of you learned it as a kid? Raise your hand. Only Larry Pauls? Oh my goodness, then we do have to learn it, don't we? And you know it? Oh great, just now. <laughs> Smart fella. Okay, well you take after your parents. <laughs> okay, let's try it again and sing out loud. Everybody help us. You cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you cannot hide from God. From you, you cannot hide from God. Thank you. What do you do when something happens that you're afraid? You know it's wrong. 
What do you do? Any ideas? You can hide behind a tree, but it's a special tree, one like that, the cross of Jesus, because then you hide with the heart of God and you're safe. Dear Heavenly Father, hiding in thee is our special gift from you. And though we sin every day, we know that you have forgiveness through the cross of Jesus. In your name, amen. Might be hot, be careful. Sing him number one.
Good morning, church. Good morning. So we're going to do our time of prayer. I wondered if you guys had any prayer requests. Or if you want to give a victory of praise report, that's fine too. But anybody who has something. A lot of people in Iowa lost their, their shelter this week through the tornado. Okay. Oh, your cousins, yes. Okay. okay. All right, well then let's, let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much that we can come here and worship together, Lord. We thank you for this body of believers, our, our, our friends and family, Lord, that, that are our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I, I thank you for this church. And Lord, I, I just ask that you would uh, help those who have suffered the damages of the storms this week, Lord, that, that through it, that they would see your power and presence, Lord, that they would come to know you, Father, and we pray for relief for those who are hurting and, and are in need, Lord. Uh, we lift up Hattie's cousins to you right now and the situation they're going through, Father, that you would oh, just make yourself known to them and their family mightily on their behalf, Lord. And Father, I just pray for this, this church body as it, as it steps forward through the getting a, a new pastor, Lord. I just pray for wisdom for the, the elders, Lord, to, to make uh, wise decisions. And we pray for the, the right person to come here, Lord, and that that would just be known. Father, I pray for the community of Belmont, Lord, and how this church can be an outreach for that, that community, Lord. Um, I just pray for open doors of opportunity for everyone here to minister to their neighbors, their friends, their family, Lord. And uh, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, we lift up this service to you, Father. And I pray that uh, you would anoint this message, that uh, you would open our hearts to receive, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to be back. It's been a while, but it's good to see all your faces. So this story that I have to open with, um, a, f a pastor friend of mine shared this story with me. So this is a true story, uh, as unbelievable as it may sound. So this happened in southern Iowa uh, several decades ago, probably. Uh, there was a, a man that had passed away. Uh, he was well known in the community for his lifestyle. And uh, it, it was, he wasn't, uh, I don't know, he was kind of a troublemaker. Let's just put it that way. And so this pastor friend of mine uh, was asked if, if he could go to the funeral with part of the family who was attending his church. And so he went to this other town uh, to, to attend this funeral. And there was one, I guess there's one church in town, uh, this old, older, older gentleman uh, was the pastor, and he came up on this stage, and uh, he said, I think his first words were, uh, Make no mistake, most of us probably already know that when Joe died, he went straight to hell. <laughs> and my friend, my friend thought, oh dear, if there's going to be a mutiny, like people are going to like erupt. And, and he, he looked around and everyone was just sort of like nodding in agreement, like, yeah. Now that pastor had, had pastored that community, so he was in, in a position where people... Uh, uh, trusted him, and he really had, had the heart for the community. And he followed that up by saying, um, and the reason that I'm here today is to make sure that you don't follow him. And then he just went, we went after it, preaching the gospel, the goodness of, of Christ, and uh, the hope of, of eternity. Now, that was, uh, that was pretty drastic and eye-opening, but it's interesting that there is a parable in the Bible that isn't exactly like that, but it gives us some insight into potentially what it's like uh, after, after we die. At least it was in Jesus' day. And so uh, this is a parable that Jesus told, but in all likelihood, it could have been actual events. I mean, Jesus uses the guy's name. Uh, he calls him Lazarus, if you guys are familiar with that. So we are going to be in Luke 16 today, and that, that was our scripture reading uh, for this morning, uh, Luke 16, 19, and we'll just go through the scripture reading um, as we uh, uh, unpack the, the message. So 
There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So, can you imagine the state of Lazarus right here? Okay, it was bad. Life was, life was tough for him. It was difficult. He probably had a miserable existence. I, I mean, not any of us would say that's, the, that's my dream to be that, right? So he was totally dependent on others uh, for his existence. He was an outcast, left outside of the gate. No one paid attention to him um, except, except for the dogs. Um, but then you have the rich man who was wealthy. He was uh, luxurious in his living, very comfortable. He's dressed in fine, elegant clothing. He had all his needs in that. Um, he probably was the center of attention in his world, most likely. Uh, I'm guessing he had servants that looked after him. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of people probably wanted to be like him, really. So, do you see the contrast between these two individuals that Jesus is framing up here in that scripture? Uh, and and there was, a, there was a, a concept in Jesus' time, and I think maybe we hold some of it today too, but the idea was that the rich must be righteous. And so, if the rich are righteous, then the poor must be sinners, and they must be the lost. And so, um, a lot of people's ideas hinge on this external appearance and how things were. So, um, an example of what, the, what was thought of the rich is found in Matthew. So, we're going to flip over to Matthew here. And uh, in this situation, there was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he asked him, what do I need to do to get eternal life? And, and Jesus walks through a dialogue with him about keeping the commandments and that sort of stuff. And then at the end of it, you know, the guy says, yeah, I've done all that. But Jesus says, well, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And uh, so I'm going to pick up in verse 23 here. Uh, then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Do you see the, the disciples' response? They're like, Wait, if the rich can't go to heaven... Like, it's hard for them. Like, how is it possible for anyone? Um, so you see their reaction there. Um, because in their minds, in the, the concept of that day was probably almost like it was automatic. Like, well, you must be righteous. You must be righteous uh, because you're rich. Like, that, they just probably work hand in hand. And so when Jesus tells them, that's not the way it goes. It's actually hard for the rich people to get to heaven. He, like, turned that perception on its head for the disciples. And they're like, wait a minute, everything we thought must be wrong here. Um, so that's how they viewed the rich. Like, it was like, oh, the rich must be the righteous. But let's look at how they viewed the poor then. So if you go to John 9, starting right at the beginning, uh, verse 1, it says, uh, As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Do you notice the perception that is in those statements? Like they looked at the guy who couldn't see, the blind guy, and their question that they want to know is, who caused his blindness? Like, who, who, is he the bad sinner, or was it, were, were his parents the really bad sinners? Um, but they must be sinful. Like, he must be sinful, or he must come from a sinful family. Um, and most of this came because of the self-righteous teaching of the, the religious leaders in that day. So that, that was the view that they, they were getting that. Um, the, the, the Pharisees were very much worried about the exterior, 
how you looked, how you presented yourself, that you were doing things that were noticeable for other people to be righteous. And so this thinking had permeated the culture. And so that's, that's one of the reasons that we see these two examples where it was like, well, wait a minute, why can't, it's hard for rich people to get to heaven? And well, who sinned? Because this guy, he's blind. So obviously something terrible must have taken place. And Jesus, like, he's working to switch this all around. Um, he, he doesn't focus on the exterior appearances. He wasn't worried about um, being associated with sinners. And remember, when, I, when Jesus was associated with sinners, it's because those people weren't cleaned up. They didn't look like the religious people of the day, the scribes, the Pharisees. And so, well, there's Jesus hanging out with those sinners. But you know what? Jesus knew the heart of those people. He knew that they were repentant and that they, they knew that they needed a Savior. Um, so then if we skip to the end of uh, John chapter 9 here, so this is the, kind of the end of the story of, of the blind man. Uh, let's go to John nine thirty nine. It says, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who are with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? So, okay, this might be a little bit deep because it, it sounds a little... It sounds a little strange there, but if we unpack this um, and look at what the scripture is really saying here, this is a direct reference to the blind man's healing and the disciples' question, but but Jesus turned it around on them. So he came for those who know that they're blind and that needed help. He's not talking about the physically blind at this point, but more of the spiritually blind. And so those who know they need help, those who know they have a problem that they can't fix with their own righteousness, that's who he's addressing. They, they, they need a savior to come, open their eyes, so, so that they can not only see, but they can spiritually be healed and look and see their savior and Lord. Now the Pharisees ask the question. So that's what Jesus is talking about there. He's like, I came, I came so that the blind will see. So if you know you're blind, I came to offer you spiritual healing in that. Now, the Pharisees, they say, wait, what? So are we blind too? And uh, Jesus says, oh, yeah, you're blind. (laughs) You're you're blind to what's sitting right in front of you. The problem is that you think that you can see, and that's the issue here. You think your righteousness is enough on, on your own, and you don't think you need help from anybody else. You have it all figured out. You think you see God but you miss him standing right in front of you. So yeah, the Pharisees were blind. Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt of sin. Meaning, if you knew you were blind like this man, you'd know that you need spiritual help, and you'd be looking at me, at Jesus, and he'd, take, and he'd be the one taking the sin away. Uh, you, you'd be without sin at that point. Uh, but uh, instead... You say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Because, you don't, because they didn't think they needed Jesus. They thought, that their, they thought that their spiritual condition was healthy. We're great. <clears throat> so through those examples, we see how society uh, viewed social status and confused that with your spiritual condition of your heart. Uh, we also get a glimpse uh, through Jesus' words how he view, viewed the spiritual condition versus the physical condition of people in Matthew 5. So Matthew 5, 3, it's part of the uh, Beatitudes, said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what's he talking about here? <clears throat> He's not talking about carnal wealth. He's talking about poor in spirit. So we can parallel that to what we just looked at with the blind men and the Pharisees. Those who know that they're poor in spirit and know that they need help, those are the ones that he's talking about here. Those who are willing to admit they have a need. So there's two words in the, in the Greek for poor. Uh, one, one of those words, the definition that comes with that, is the, uh, the um, you, you're, you're, you have lack, but you have the ability to improve your own situation. So you're poor, but you can work. So you, you're poor, but you, you could get out of that under your own strength. Now, there's another word for poor in the Greek language, 
And that's one that means that you're lacking, but you have no ability to improve your situation. You're poor and you can't work. You're totally dependent on someone else for your survival and for your needs. And so in this text where Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the word that he uses there is the one that means that you're, you're lacking and you have no ability to help yourself. So he's saying, you got to realize that you need, you need a savior. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Um, blessed are those who are spiritually broken and know that Jesus is the only one who can save. So if we go back to our parable then in Luke, in Luke 16, we're going to pick up in verse 22. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so then the time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So let's compare what happened in the physical world here. We have have both men die. And the, 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 the rich guy, I'm just guessing, he probably had a pretty fancy funeral. I'm sure that he was buried in a in a nice tomb. Uh he was commemorated, I'm sure. There was probably some sort of a marker or inscription that, uh, that re- reminded everyone who he was. Uh, there was a, probably a lot of recognition and, and pomp surrounding the ceremony of, of his, his death, his, his funeral. Probably a lot of people got involved, and I'm sure there were several people who were mourning his death. So we have that picture, right? <clears throat> but Lazarus now... The beggar, he died. He was likely alone on the street or at the gate where he's, wherever he slept. Uh, it was doubtful that anyone noticed right away that he had passed away. Um, he was probably picked up without any fanfare by some servants who noticed him. And probably was a hassle to deal with it. Like, now we got a dead body here we got to take care of. Um, now, we've got to get rid of it because he's going to start stinking. Now, we don't know this for sure. So they could have buried him. But it's likely, it's possible that he was carried to the edge of the city and his body was tossed over the edge into the valley of Gehenna, which was the city dump. That's where the refuse, the waste, dead animals, criminals, those without family who could bury him, were cast. And... A fire burned there continuously. Um, it was a filthy, stenchy place, smoldering debris. You can imagine how awful that was, uh, everything that would be associated with that environment. And so it's possible that that's where this guy ended up. So you got the rich man in, probably in a fancy, nice tomb. And, and, and the beggar, there's a good chance that's maybe where he ended up. Now, Gehenna is also the word that's used for hell. So in the physical world, Lazarus was forgotten kicked aside, an outcast who died alone, his physical body tossed in a place where people get the name for hell. Yet, Scripture says that he was escorted by angels to Abraham's bosom while the rich man was buried. So in verse uh, 23 there, we'll pick up on there. Actually, I'm going to read it off my Bible because I have the Scripture breaks here. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, the rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. <clears throat> so the... The rich man gets buried. He has a fancy funeral, memorial tomb. But we see that in the, in the spiritual realm, he went straight to hell. So um, now when we, when we die, I'm just going to take a little sidebar here, okay? So we talk about uh, Hades, the unseen world. Um, that's a, that would be a temporary place where the departed spirits went, in uh, Old Testament times, I guess. 
Uh, so it was divided into two, two sides. You had Abraham's bosom, which is what was described there. So it would be like the paradise, the happy side. And then you had Hades, which would be the, the side of, of torment. Um, this isn't, like, this isn't the, the lake of fire. This is just was the, the interim place. Because in the book of Revelation, if you want to read about that, go to Revelation 20. Um, <clears throat> you'll read about how in the end... After the great white throne judgment where all the people who are judged who never received Christ are sent to the lake of fire, the devil, the demons are sent to the lake of fire, and it says that death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. So, so that would be the, the final, the final uh, place of torment would be the lake of fire. Hades was a place of departed spirits. So you got the good side, you got the bad side. Uh, before Jesus died on the cross and descended down there, he emptied out the happy side. Uh, and so that's, that's where everyone went because there was no sacrifice yet. So when Jesus died, he descended, led captivity captive, and ascended to heaven, taking out all the, it would be the, the Old Testament saints, those who believed with him to heaven. So now the only people that would end up in Hades would be unbelievers who die. So 2 Corinthians 2 or 2 Corinthians 5:8 tells us that uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So any believer today who would die goes to heaven and he, and there where they're with God. Now the idea of purgatory and all that stems from some intertestamental writings along with this idea of paradise uh, in Hades, but that's that's no longer there. So that was a little sidebar, as I keep us all up. That's what he's talking about at, at this point in time. <coughs> so, all right, so um, here the rich man finds himself in Hades, in hell. He's conscious, he's recognizable, he's volitional, he's, he's in torment, uh, he's begging, and he, he begs that, uh, he begs for help from the, um, the beggar, right? And so Lazarus is in the other side. Uh, he's waiting for Jesus to come, take him back, take back what, all that, 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 that was forfeited in the garden by sin, make that final sacrifice, and carry all of those Old Testament saints to heaven. So in verses 25 and 26, Abraham replies that he can't do what the rich man has requested. He explains how the rich man got his reward while he was in the physical world. So without Jesus, the pleasures of this life, that, that's all that the rich man got. And he ends up in hell. So when he's denied any relief, then there comes a shift in the story. And I, I think this is kind of the biggest point, really. So if we read in Luke 16 again, Starting in verse 27. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. <clears throat> so the rich man's plea, he, it changed from his own sufferings to warning his family. And uh, Abraham isn't being harsh there. He's just, being, he's just telling him the reality of it. Um, God is working to reach the lost world. And, and, and we always seem to think we have a better way. Like this guy says, hey, why don't you raise somebody from the dead and go, go tell, tell my family that uh, they need to change their ways because uh, what's after this life, they don't want any part of it. So go tell them. Um, he doesn't want them to perish. Um, but in the same way, God doesn't want anyone to perish. He, he's, he is working to reach for all of us. Um, Acts 17, 26 tells us that he's placed all of us where we are in this time of history, in the, the country, the nation, where we are, in hopes that we'll just reach out and find him because he's not far from us. He's right there. So he's doing everything he can. He speaks to us through our creation, through our conscience, 
and, and, and through the word of God. Um, so those who are seeking him, he's going to reveal himself to them. That's why it says in Hebrews, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So in this story, um, it's interesting. Jesus is, is prophetically speaking about what he himself was going to end up doing. Because at this point, he hadn't died yet. Jesus hadn't died, but he's telling this parable. And, and he actually does exactly what the rich man requested, right? If you think about this. And, and in twofold. So the really cool part is, because I love how the Bible like just works together. Not only did Jesus come back from the dead, which we all know about, but there was also a day when Jesus stood in front of a tomb and he called, called out to a man by the name of Lazarus and said, come up out of the grave. Now, it wasn't the same guy. It wasn't the same Lazarus, but the image is so powerful. And then Jesus did the same thing. He dies and he raises from the dead, yet people still don't believe. And, and the point of like what, what Jesus had quoted as uh, Abraham saying in the, in the parable was that, you know what, if they've heard Moses and the prophets, they aren't going to be willing to see Jesus is the Messiah either. Uh, if their hearts resist um, what's been placed before them in nature, if they quiet or suppress their conscience to the things of God that he's put in front of them, they're not going to see Jesus as, as the resurrected Savior, which he was. So it's just interesting how this, this all works out. First off, you have the image in this life and what spiritually really happens, and then that just like gets flipped over on end. And, and, uh, and also just knowing that there is a testimony, like Jesus did come out of the grave to, to, to be a, a testimony, that, that there's more than this life, and that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So as we close up, I'm going to turn to Revelation 3.16. Um, and the point of the message here today is, if the lost could come back, they would preach the gospel to us because it's true. And the Bible tells us one day every knee will bow uh, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And it's way better to do it on this side of eternity than, than before it's too late. So in Revelation 3, 16, um, Jesus is speaking to the church. And he says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. Realize your need. That's what he's saying. You have to realize your need and realize that Jesus is the one who provides that. So if you're here this morning and you haven't made a decision to follow the Lord, I encourage you, it's an easy thing to do. Admit that you're a sinner. Admit that you're blind, that you need help, and repent. Uh, believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to save us from our sins and that he rose from the dead and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's it. And you're, in, you're, in, you're at that moment, if you believe that, if you're saying it genuinely, then the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you and, and your life will change. Now, for the rest of us who say, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I'm good with the Lord, I know. How many of you have brothers or sisters who, who need to, to be warned before it's too late? And so I just want you to take a minute and think about those family members that may not be walking with the Lord, those friends of yours who may not be walking with the Lord, or neighbors down the street. I want you to think about that as potentially that's your mission field. And some of you may say, well, I, I can't reach them. Like there's something that's happened. Like there's, there, there's, there's a block they won't receive from me. And, and that's okay, as, as my pastor put it. How many of you would want somebody else then to go and talk to them if you're not able to because the doors have been closed? And if you say, yeah, I would love for somebody else to be able to talk to them, 
that's great. Pray that way, but also maybe you can be that someone for somebody else's someone who needs someone to talk to them. I know that was a lot of someones. Are you following along? So in this, commit to pray for them. Look for those opportunities. Pray for the opportunities where you can share. Purpose your conversations to move towards the Lord because there's a lot at stake. So give them, give them the good news. Um, it, it will change their life. Um, and I guess with that, we're going to close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the good news that you are, you are a resurrection in life, Lord. I pray for divine opportunities to tell others about that good news, Lord. I pray that, pray that you would prepare their hearts and prepare ours to minister to them, Lord. I pray for open opportunities this coming week and in, and in the weeks to follow, Lord, that we can minister to those who don't know you, Lord. And help us to recognize those situations when that person walks right up to us and the conversation starts, Lord. Give us the boldness to step out in that, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Do we stand for this next hymn?
deacons come forward for the offering. Lord God, we are so appreciative of what you've given us. And in this moment, we get an opportunity to give back some of that, Lord. We're thankful for that. Lord, I ask that you would bless this offering, that it would go to do your work of the kingdom, Lord, and that you would multiply it, and that you would bless those who are faithful in giving. In your name we pray. Amen. First off, I'd like to thank Eric for uh, the message we had this morning that was uh, kind of challenging at the end, Eric. Uh, we do, uh, we appreciate that. We need that every once in a while to realize that uh, God has plans for all of us and uh, we all have neighbors, family members, whatever, that uh, I think we can definitely uh, try and tell them about the good news. Uh, the only other thing I have is next week we will have a consistory meeting after the morning worship service. Thank you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.